Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us as the Cleveland Foundation's annual meeting presented by KeyBank continues. I'm Kathy Hallisey, Program Director for Leadership Development, and I'm thrilled to be joined by this wonderful panel to talk about leadership now. So first, we have Stephanie Molnar, who's our who is the Cleveland Foundation Program Officer for Leadership Development and also an alum of our summer internship program. We have Lori Yorogi Eiler, who is a educator and a uh, participant in our Cleveland Encore programming. We have Michael Elliott, who is also a former a participant of our summer internship program, as well as the Director of Economic Development for Cleveland Neighborhood Progress. And last but not least is Olivia Ortega. She is alum of the Cleveland Foundation's Public Service Fellowship and is currently the Director of Government Advocacy for Greater Cleveland Partnership. Wow, what an incredible panel that we have. So please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions as we go and we'll answer as many as we can. Um, so please use that function. So thank you again for joining us today. And now let's get started with this important conversation. I would begin that leadership has always been a part of who we are as the world's first community foundation. It is integral to who we are, our mission and our place in the community. While the foundation has been committed to being a leader in many ways, for example, our recent partnership with the community over the Greater Cleveland uh, COVID-19 rapid, rapid Response Fund, we also believe that leadership development is critical to support our community in addressing needs and opportunities. So as a result, the Cleveland Foundation has made leadership development one of its core priorities. As you see on the slide before you, we accomplish this through partnerships with key institutions and through the creation and implementation of our own programs. This feature is also embedded within the foundation's strategic priorities. We also believe in an intergenerational approach. So beginning with high school students participating in St. Martin de Porres corporate work study program, and then continuing kind of follow the U all the way up to Encore Cleveland, which helps and supports those individuals who are at or nearing retirement. In addition, we align our work with other nonprofits other nonprofits in the greater Cleveland area who support individuals in their leadership journey, such as Neighborhood Connections. In thinking about our session today, we asked some of our recent participants to reflect on what is a leader. And I would love to show their responses now in this short video. A leader is somebody who unifies. It's somebody who has a deep understanding of the group of people that they lead. It's also somebody that is committed with the personal and professional growth of the people around them. And finally, it's somebody who listens to others' ideas and needs. Being a leader is an outstanding individual, someone who can go through trials and tribulations, highs and lows, ups and downs, adversity, and even difficult times in life. As a leader, I realize there's going to be times where you're going to be alone. You can't count on someone, but it's okay because it's going to build your character. It's going to build who you are. Leaders are humble. Leaders are interested in other people coming before themselves. Leaders are interested in amplifying the voices of others around them and those with perspectives that add value to the changes that they want to see happen. A leader is someone who finds the balance between empathy and execution. By leveraging the synergy of these two skills, teams will thrive despite the chaos. A leader recognizes movements transcend any one person, knowing when to step up and when to step back. A leader is human, one who admits mistakes with humility, acknowledges privileges, is transparent about weaknesses, and confident in their strengths. Leaders want to see the world change for the better. And you know, a leader never stops learning. That's a leader. Wow. Every time I see that video, I get, I just, it just really inspires me. So, Stephanie, I, uh, these emerging leaders have really given this panel and our audience participants much to think about during our discussion. So thank you for facilitating this important conversation with Michael, Olivia, and Lori. Stephanie? Thank you, Kathy. Thank you everyone for joining us today for this conversation on Leadership Now. 
Um, I want to start by really jumping off of some of the points that we heard in the video um, that were highlighted by our recent participants. So when we think about leaders, we think about individuals that are able to understand and unify groups of people. They're able to balance empathy and execution, know when to step up and when to step back, uh, empower those around them, and as you heard at the end, never stop learning. Um, so as we think about all of those things through our conversation today, I want to start by also tying into the theme of the annual meeting, 2020 Community Vision, um, and asking this question first to Olivia, and then we'll go to Michael and Lori. What do you see as your vision for leadership in Greater Cleveland in the decade ahead? Thanks, Stephanie. Um, first, I, I just want to say thanks so much to the Cleveland Foundation and to the two of you for having me on today. Um, Kathy and Stephanie, you both have um, been there for me um, since I began my career here in Cleveland, um, perhaps more than you know. Um, I really, really appreciated Ron's words earlier about how we've fallen short as a community. And, and I really appreciate his honesty um, in that it will take more of that honesty, frankly, if we hope to turn a corner, which leads me to think about um, sort of what I hope to see for the future of leadership over the course of the next however many years in Cleveland. Um, I think w one of the main pillars of what I hope to see is um, like real true inclusivity. Um, so beyond um, inviting all voices or diverse, a diversity of voices to the table, ensuring that once they get there, there is a real willingness and, and, and level setting of respect um, for those that are um, new or um, just, just true inclusiveness, I think, really means that everyone feels comfortable enough and, and respected and, and, and um, courageous enough to share their thoughts. Um, I often feel like that's a key step that's missed um, around tables today. And I also hope that leadership in the future is multi-generational. Um, I think that over the course of the next 10 years in particular, Cleveland, our region will face serious challenges um, beyond what we're seeing currently. Anything from implications of climate change to the shifting of our economy. Um, so I, I truly hope that leadership in the future is, you know, dynamic enough to meet those challenges um, in that, you know, they, they, um, they're brave enough to admit when they don't know the answer and strong enough to invite those in that perhaps do have that expertise or that firsthand experience. Um, and then it brings it back to that inclusivity point um, that once those folks are brought in, you know, how do we ensure that all voices um, are heard and, and respected and listened to? Thank you, Olivia. Michael, let's turn it over to you. Same question. What's your vision for leadership in Greater Cleveland in the decade ahead? Thank you very much for that question. I think it's an excellent question, especially in times that we're living in. I'm thinking about my beautiful 14-year-old daughter, and I'm thinking about what type of world um, do I want her to live in 10 years when she's 24 years old? What type of leadership do I, do leadership skills do I want her to possess as an individual? So there's really three things that I'm thinking about as far as the type of leadership that I foresee um, in the decade to come. Uh, the one is, is we, we got to be more loving to one another. I know that might sound cliche, and you don't really hear that in a professional setting all that much. But we really have to be very loving, kind with one another, um, patient with one another, kind of that first Corinthians 13 kind of love where we're actually kind of looking at the humanity of one another and saying to ourselves, how can I serve you? How can I build you up? How can I edify you? Another thing I, I'm thinking about leadership that we need for this decade is really leadership that is truly tolerant, not just the tolerance that we look at as far as um, you have to accept me, but the tolerance that a classical definition of tolerance where despite your differences, um, I can still live at peace with you in harmony and we can still, you know, go to happy hour or we can still have lunch after work or something like that. So that's a tolerance is very important for me. And lastly, I'm looking for wise leadership, leadership that has, is wise, that can um, have some foresight, uh, understanding that, you know, the decisions that we're making today is going to have impact um, not just for tomorrow, not just for the next year, but for generations to come. So becoming more loving to one another. And again, I know that's cliche, but again, we really need to maybe edify that a little bit more. 
um, becoming more tolerant of our differences, as well as becoming have be, becoming more wise um, and more forth um, and a little bit more foresight as far as how our impacts are going to affect the future down the road. Thank you, Michael. And Lori, I'd love to hear your vision too before we sort of move on to our next questions. Thank you. Um, first, thanks for also um, having me here. Um, it's wonderful to be here as an educator and as an encore participant. Um, and I just want to put an exclamation point on everything that Michael and Olivia said, um, because they are right on point about really what what is needed. Um, the, the one thing that I would add um, that I hope that we don't sort of lose the lessons of 2020, but we also don't lose that urgency that we approach leadership with um, around action and, and a, a willingness to step in, step up, um, and, and in ways that were um, totally alien to maybe our positional um, power of wherever we had in community and also with new partners. Um, I hope for greater Cleveland leadership that like we're on, when we're on the shores of that progress and opportunity that we've all learned in the next decade, how to uh, collectively surf those waves, whether they are, you know, itty bitty waves um, or a giant tsunami um, like we experienced in 2020. Um, and I mostly that I want to add to the conversation. I hope that we see greater Clevelanders, whether they're age nine or 90 um, and even anger, uh, you know, younger or older than those parameters, because really that's, you know, just arbitrary, um, that we see everyone as leaders and we, um, we cease to surf together with agility. Um, that there's no longer a they, as both Olivia and Michael have said, um, that there's only a we, and that leaders now are a, co a collective we of leadership. Um, and finally, I want to kind of think of 2020 like Greater Cleveland had laser surgery on our eyes when we think about vision. And, and I think everybody has alluded to it, but I think that's the best way. Like, we can't unsee what we have seen, okay? And we don't need glasses anymore, our own little prescriptions, right? Like, we, we, we've all had that corrected vision, and it's been honest about our inability to see certain things and to see certain people. And so when we look around us in the future, we do see leaders as whether they're nine or 90. Um, and the, de uh, the decade ahead, it's a thriving collective leadership network that rules the day with trusting relationships. And as a shout out to Stephanie and Kathy and your leadership and what you modeled in Encore, where people have um, and people involved have the ability to really be vulnerable and speak their truths and their experiences, even when things have turned on a dime and each other up in, in that, in that work. Um, yeah. But explanation point on every, whatever, ever has been said. That's Thank you, Lori. Uh, and thank you all. So there's definitely some themes across all of your responses in terms of making sure that everything is more inclusive um, and really sort of spanning generations as we look to leadership moving ahead. Uh, I'm into some of the questions that are coming into the chat too. So I think leadership is kind of unique in that in all of the areas that Ron mentioned in um, his opening address and in the other sessions today. Um, so as we think about that, where do you see individuals right now that are really stepping into leadership roles to address key issues? And I imagine some of this is sort of more of a scaled down version of what your overall vision is. But today, and we can maybe start this one with Michael, um, where do you see individuals really stepping up to lead in this moment? Well, I, I really do enjoy working in the uh, entrepreneur space, working with small business owners as they really think uh, out the box or really become very creative in how they solve many of the issues 
uh, that we're facing in our country right now. Uh, so one of the things that I'm really enjoying, especially when it comes to uh, COVID-19, is businesses are becoming very resilient. Um, they're sharing ideas with one another. Um, I work within the CDC space, the Community Development Corporation space. I'm, I'm, I'm very loving all of the, um, the, the drive and the motivation that many of the CDCs have in making sure that entrepreneurs and business owners and residents are basically getting their meet, uh, needs left. I'm thinking about like stories coming out of certain CDCs where literally uh, for those businesses or for those residents that are not, do not have access to technology, uh, but they still need to have this very viable information, literally putting on their own mask, knocking door to door, going to the community and saying, hey, you know, I understand that you may not be able to get this information in this more up-to-date modern way, but I want to make sure that you have this information ready for you. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I mean, we're really, I know that a, a lot of us are very fortunate fortunate uh, probably on this uh, webinar to be working from home but again there are individuals out there who are out in the field day to day serving our food or, or taking care of us while we're sick I really do appreciate all the help that entrepreneurs and individuals within the nonprofit sector as far as their creativity and their innovation as they uh, seek to navigate um, the world that we're in right now thank you Michael Olivia or Laura, Laura you do you have a response too? And then we can go to Olivia. Sure. Um, I love that different individuals have actually stepped up into different leadership spaces um, to do different things and, the, and use the skills that they had in one space for another. Um, once COVID-19 uh, hit, uh, there, there was almost a Nike approach to, to leadership, right? We're going to just do it. And I saw individuals push in ways that they had never pushed before and actually harder. Um, and then people were heard in ways that they weren't heard. An example I can think of is Chanel Smith and Dante Gibbs, who created Mass for Community. And in a few months, they distributed in neighborhoods in Cleveland and East Cleveland 77,000 masks that were then accompanied by a newsletter about COVID-19 health information, as well as completing the census, as well as voting and an activity sheet. And Evelyn Burnett had offered um, Third Space Action Lab her space by saying, this is, this is your space because it's community space um, and it was open and volunteers across communities, including multiple generations, including the Cavs and their staff, um, came in small groups, socially distanced to put the mass together. And then um, this is all too, thanks to the Cleveland Foundation, Greater Cleveland COVID-19 Rapid Response Fund, um, where some masks were funded uh, originally, and this work was funded. And then they partnered with other groups that have been doing work like the NAACP, Young Latina, Metro Health, et cetera. I mean, I could I don't want to do a laundry list of everyone, but from an idea of one individual, Chanel Smith, and then coupled with a friend who is also a leader, Dante Gibbs, who I know this story because he was a former student, um, they went to empowering people to be healthy with 77,000 masks. And that was with the help of the Cleveland Foundation. And I think that's just one example. I mean, Honey Bell Bay, our county poet laureate, uh, she started her own food bank, uh, went on, did her own online learning around literacy and puppeteering and art and cooking. Uh, Marlon Grimes, a former CMBA president, started a digital divide subcommittee so that the great three R work of the Cleveland Bar could go forward in a digital world and CMS Cleveland School students could have what they needed. Um, and more Important, I think too is people did not pause. So when schools, and I know the education world, right? When, when school buildings shut down, right? Because it was the buildings that shut down. Um, people became very innovative around how do we go forward? What can we do? And important initiatives such as um, the equity initiative at Campus International found a way to go forward virtually. That was the most important. People didn't let go, and while well, they still leaned in. Thank you, Lori. Olivia. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add quickly. Um, I think 
some one of the things that most stood out to me um, over the course of the last six months, um, and particularly over the course of the last three months, um, I've been just so impressed with individuals um, within my organization and others, but particularly um, many folks within the Greater Cleveland Partnership. Um, and I'm not just talking about senior leadership, I'm talking about on down from that, people that haven't even been there um, for a year. They really, really spoke up and began to um, openly talk about how our organization can be more accountable, openly initiating sustainable conversations about racial equity, and initiating dialogues around um, the history of our organization in this community um, and, and the work that um, we've done past, present, and need to continue doing in the future. Um, f frankly, it, 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 a level of accountability that we haven't seen before. Um, I, I've been really impressed with the bravery of people um, within my organization and I, and I think within um, other organizations throughout the, the civic sector in Cleveland um, towards really pushing for sustainable dialogue um, around racial equity and, and, and what that means um, in our community. Thank you, Olivia. And I think that can tie a little bit into um, some of the other questions that we have coming up too, as we think about making sure um, that racial equity is a larger piece and an inherent piece really of all of those discussions. Um, so I know one of the questions that came in from an audience member asked how the Cleveland Foundation is getting the word out throughout the neighborhoods um, to really make sure that young people in Cleveland are exposed to leadership. Um, so yes, I, I think that's crucial to the work that we do. Um, and I think moving forward, in addition to the Cleveland Foundation, it's really making sure that there's a network to um, engage people. Um, I would say a lot of our work so far has relied heavily on um, alumni programs and different individuals at various institutions um, to really help spread the word and get more people engaged. Um, but I'd love to hear from our panelists as, you know, it, engagement, I think, is a huge piece that we need to focus on and really be more inclusive about as we move forward. Um, but we're thinking about leadership development, um, whether it's maybe that engagement piece or something else, what do you see as something that's missing from the leadership development ecosystem here in Cleveland? Um, and maybe start this one with Lori. I want to applaud the person who reached out on the chat to talk about young people because actually that's what I see is the missing sort of piece in leadership um, development if we talk about inclusion is at the youngest end just like Encore empowered me and opened doors for other people in my age affinity group and the Cleveland Foundation does a great job you know with high school students um, and we also include middle school students but I want people to think broader about leadership development and that even our youngest individuals in our community, they too age just on the same continuum as all of us, right? Um, and just like, you know, you play a little league, right? And varsity and then pro ball, I really think we need to bring leadership down to um, the elementary level as far as development goes. And one actionable step would be around di dialogue, which Olivia, right? Instead of this discussion, I wait for my turn to talk or debate where I'm trying to um, really uh, win you over to my side and I'm not really listening to the other side. Um, I think the multicultural competency of dialogue across all ages and generations actually would be the a beautiful next step to really develop that in all people. We'll do better. In inclusion and equity and starting young. Thank you, Lori. So Michael, and then maybe we'll go to Olivia last. Um, what else do you see as areas that we could do better in terms of the leadership development ecosystem? Um, so shout out to Cleveland State. I, I'm an alumni of Cleveland State and uh, LeVan College of Urban Studies. Um, one of the things that I remember, at least in the master program, is the importance of emotional intelligence um, in their conversations. And I, and I really don't hear that. Maybe it might be worded differently, but emotional intelligence, I think, should, should be probably incorporated a lot more into the master's or even the undergrad or, or <laughs> why not K through 12. Um, you know, having that ability to um, 
help children understand their own emotions and the emotions of others and how to navigate that. Because we live in a very diverse world, with very diverse opinions, uh, ways of life, and, and really need to have an understanding of how to navigate the emotion, emotional aspects of these dynamics that we're living in. So emotional intelligence, I think, is, is very critical um, as we talk more about leadership. Uh, but I also want, um, you know, I grew up in the church, you know, my ex- first exposure to leadership was, you know, pastors and deacons. Um, I, I have a saying that say economic development starts at home. Um, I think that leadership starts at home too. And I think that parents, um, instead of necessarily relying on organizations outside of your house, really maybe focusing on how, how I, as a parent, as mom, dad, can, can cultivate leadership within my child by how they interact with their brothers or sisters or how, as the authority, as a parent, how you respect authority. So, you know, those things should start in the home. And I know that organizations um, play a role in that, uh, but I am really, really want to encourage leadership development to start at home uh, with the individual, um, as well as within those smaller communities that we, we find ourselves in on a regular basis. I'll just, yeah, I'll just quickly add, um, first of all, I think the foundation does an amazing job with throughout across its programming. Um, and I think for me in particular, that like this question was hard for me to think about. Um, I had such an amazing experience with the Cleveland Foundation Public Service Fellowship, which was one pivotal in me finding work that was that was paid that was in po- public policy it was in an area that i was passionate about i mean that was just that was that was real i was really lucky um for that and then and then beyond that it exposed me to um lines of work that i never knew existed um and now i'm i'm in the advocacy space and grew up always sort of wanting to to work in civil service or public service but never understanding all of the different avenues and forms that that could take. And so that exposure um, was was really critical. When I when I think about um, one of the biggest things missing, and, and it's hard to verbalize this, um, but um, I think about um, just like very intense intentionality um, on um, helping younger people get to where they have the potential to go. Um, you know, when I didn't under, I didn't fully understand how to utilize my network. I didn't fully understand how to write a cover letter or a resume or any of that. And it really took like a certain level of poking and prodding from people that were sort of like very determined to be my mentor. Um, even if I wasn't fully showing it because I, because you know, um, you're, you're shy and you don't fully know and, and how to navigate those spaces. Um, so again, it's, it, it comes down to me, um, this this level of intentionality um, that has to go in, like sustained intentionality, um, working with young people, not just shooting them the, the job announcement, but like sitting down with them for coffee uh, and helping them write the resume or the cover letter or introducing them to the hiring manager. Um, that stuff is, is so, so important, particularly for young people um, that haven't had exposure to um, a variety of professional environments previously. Thank you, Olivia. And I, I, I agree with you completely in terms of the importance of sort of making sure that everyone is at where they're at and really sort of encouraged along that whole path you know, through that program in particular is a year, um, but really beyond. Um, there's some great ideas that are coming into the Q&A uh, too, and we're not going to have time for all of them. So um, I'd love to follow up with those of you um, that are pitching some awesome ideas that we won't get to cover today. Um, so I do want to pause to recognize that. Um, one of the questions that came in um, was asking for concrete examples of how to identify and cultivate leadership skills and opportunities among youth um, and some of our program participants. Um, and I- heard some of that in the last question. I know Michael talked a little bit about emotional intelligence being an excellent focus, um, and Olivia Olivia talked a little bit about resumes and cover letters and some of those career planning pieces. Um, I'm wondering if maybe as you look back on your professional paths and, you know, how you've gotten to where you are now, what are some of those sort of key skills maybe picked up in your program or beyond that we really 
we need to be more intentional about in some of these programs. Whoever wants to take that one too. <laughs> well, one of the things that I've, I've learned, I, again, as an alumni, uh, I was placed in the um, City of Cleveland Department of Economic Development back in 2012. And, and I'll, I'll have to say it was a very a pivotal experience for me. Um, I, 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 I want to use the word life changing because it did change my trajectory as far as professional. I knew that I needed to change my resume around. I'm going back to kind of what Olivia said. I knew I had to change the, uh, my previous experiences into more of a project management experience. So, you know, I, I was strongly encouraged to apply for the uh, alumni, excuse me, the, um, the internship opportunity with Cleveland uh, Foundation. Uh, but one of the things that, that I learned very quickly um, as far as a skill is that um, doing something that you're not too familiar with, and at that particular time, I didn't know much about economic development, um, you have to put yourself in situations that you are uncomfortable with um, in order to grow. And we are living in a world where everything has to be like comfortable for people and safe. We have to get out of that mindset that, um, yes, there might be a time for that. But as I tell my daughter all the time, life is tough. Life is hard. You have to be resilient. You have to be strong. You cannot be in these safe spaces all the time. And so one of the things that I picked up very quickly under the leadership of uh, Director Nichols is, um, you know, it's great to have a lot of meetings. It's great to talk about your thoughts. You got to be able to get stuff done. And when you're going out to an employer, um, interviewing, all they care about is, I have a problem. Can you fix it? And you should be able to articulate that to them. So as we develop leaders, we should be developing leaders uh, that should have a mindset of um, problem solving, um, not just talking. That's great. But we have to have a mindset of, I'm either going to help somebody solve a problem or I'm going to figure out how to solve a problem and as a leader, bring other folks along with me to, to take care of the problem. So um, in, in a nutshell, really having a mindset of get stuff done. That is the economic value that we all bring to the world. Our ability, yes, we are all made in the image of God. We all have worth and value, but your economic value comes into your ability to solve problems and lead others into um, that vision that you might have for your particular life. One thing quickly that jumped out um, to me in, in thinking about this question also, um, and, and I'll um, talk a little bit about an experience I had during my year as a Cleveland Foundation Public Service Fellow, which at the time I thought that this was just the most excruciating exercise, but there was one um, particular um, professional development session where we um, we had to give a, a pitch about ourselves, and it was filmed. And then the group had to sit around and watch and critique um, with, you know, with our, our cohort, our peers, other other recent graduates and people interested in public service. Um, really, honestly, sort of um, parsing through your your words um, on on camera, and um, th that alone, but so many other um, exercises like that were so crucial to me learning how to tell a story about myself and that that communication skills it, it it is so so valuable not just you know in interview settings but in how I connect with other people now um, I think it's probably part of the reason why I'm in the advocacy space and I get to talk as an advocate about so many different issues that impact our community um, but learning and understanding how to tell a story sort of unabashedly about myself um, and, and, and connect the dots for, for others um, was so critical um, in my year as a Cleveland Foundation Public Service Fellow. And I think something that um, definitely so many others could, could derive value from. Yeah, I, I appreciate you mentioning the cohort piece too, Olivia, because I really do think that having experiences where you're moving through, you know, situations and learning alongside a group of other people for you know a set period of time and really beyond I think is inherent in a lot of the work that we do too um, and I think it really plays into some of that skill development. Um, Laura, I don't know if you have anything to add in terms of skills that you would make sure are highlighted um, for up-and-coming leaders. 
I just say putting kids in spaces, um, you know, real spaces, real time, like City Club Cleveland, um, you know, the community always sponsors high school tables and kids get to go there. And then we even had an elementary um, from youth council, uh, et cetera, because real interaction, like both Olivia and Michael said, is, is what really matters in real time. And so putting people as young as possible so to, to play, right? To be, to, to create star players in our democracy, so to speak, you actually have to play the game instead of listening to people talk about it or read about it. Wow. Um, this, this has just been an amazing conversation. I think that we can really learn from what you're saying in terms of, as, of us back in our organizations and how we can nurture um, and help um, facilitate that growth. Um, so I really appreciate all the perspectives of our panel and the comments and questions. I know we didn't get to all of them were really helpful. So our collective call to action from what I've heard from you is to, to get involved, to be courageous and honest and to create spaces for all voices to be heard but not just heard, embraced, and, and given that respect, and to continue learning. So I wanna thank everyone for attending the session. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, and so please also could help me give a virtual round of applause for these incredible panelists and the facilitator. I wanna say that after this, you'll receive an invitation to take a brief community survey. We greatly value your feedback. Stephanie and I are gonna go through all these comments because there were a lot of great ideas. Um, and please continue to share your thoughts on a vision for Greater Cleveland. Also, there's still time to register for more exciting annual meeting events uh, on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So please check out the rest of the series at www.clevelandfoundation.org slash annual meeting. And I just have really appreciated this time. So thank you so much and um, have a great day. Thank you.